I'm Emma Woodhouse. I enjoy the best blessings of existence and find there is very little to vex or distress me. Isn't she clever, rich and pretty? My father and I live in the town of Highbury where our family is afforded no equals. Always a wonder to behold. She is pure perfection. Taylor, my former governess and best friend in the world, has just become Mrs. Weston. This is all you're doing, Emma. You are very kind, but love is an even stronger force than myself. You are being too modest. Yes. That is my greatest fault. Miss Woodhouse of Hartsfield, she is a saving grace. Our queen and Most distressing. Most distressing indeed. Oh, Papa, can I not persuade you to be happy? Why do young people have to get married? You would not have our new Mrs. Weston live with us forever and bear all my odd humours when she can have a house of her own? I like things as they are. Well, she deserves her own happiness now. She was happy here. Do you not think I am too old for a governess? I don't like change. So, how did you all behave at the wedding? Ah, Mr. <laughs> Knightley, so nice of you to call at this late hour. Hello, Mr. Knightley. <clears throat> Emma, come, I want answers. Who shed the most tears? Oh, poor Mrs. Weston, tis a sad business. Poor Emma is more like it. She is sorry to lose such a companion. <laughs> You're simply jealous because I've made a success of matchmaking. Matchmaking? You simply said to yourself one idle day, I think it would be a very good thing for Miss Taylor if Mr. Weston were to marry her. That's all you did. According to you. Success supposes endeavor. You made a lucky guess. That's all. <laughs> Mr. Knightley loves to find fault with me. His brother is married to my sister, and we always say what we like to one another. Emma knows I never flatter her. Or I, him. I made the match myself. I think not. In point of fact. I'm unconvinced. Who could leave such things to chance when I can be exact? <laughs> My judgment has proven correct. With all due respect, I would beg to object. I made the match myself. I think not. I joined their hands. No, still not true. They're happily united. Yes, but not because of you. Couldn't you offer some praise? I offer the truth. You can't have it both ways. Please don't speak. I wouldn't get a word in there to wise. I don't get a by you. I would try to scold you, but you're not even listening. Do I not get listening. credit for inviting them to <laughs> dinner and managing the seating, encouraging you. their friendship, and all while I was eating? Emma. Clearly I made the match myself. Yes, so you keep repeating. What about our new vicar, Mr. Elton? It would be a shame to have him single any longer. I must make a match for him. Emma! Harriet Smith is someone I have long held an interest in. She may be a parlor boarder and not remarkably clever, but with the benefit of my guidance, I believe I can make her deserving of a man of Mr. Elton's esteem. Yes, I have every faith in your ability to meddle where you do not belong. I'll make the match myself. God forbid. No task so great. That poor man. Ask her and I'll hand her to him on a silver plate. I can it's assure glorious. you. He'll find it's a crystal wife clear. May I just now say he has me yes, to, to interfere. that you do not see what I do. Yes, I could make a match. Lovely party. Yes, Miss Bates. I was just telling Mother that I do hope it does not rain, for Mother's just getting over a mild cold and the damp air could irritate her nose and throat. Irritate your nose and throat, Mother! Oh, and we 
we've just received a letter from Jane. It was over three pages in length. Three pages in length, Mother! Jane Fairfax, Miss Bates's orphan niece. Every letter from her is read 40 times over. Relations! We love them so emphatically. Relations! whenever Mr. Weston receives a letter from his son, the esteemed Frank Churchill. Oh, such lovely handwriting. I have been hearing about him my entire life, but he has yet to actually pay his father a visit. What does he write? He expresses his excitement at coming to visit. That's good news indeed. Although I do admit to being skeptical regarding the certainty of the visit. Her patience, my dear. My sister's not a well woman. Yes, but her illnesses seem to only occur at her own convenience. Relations! We love them with sincerity. Relations! We write with regularity. Keep them for posterity. But one, one cannot, cannot deny. deny. Relations! They are with us till they die. Relations! Complications! Very ill-timed! Situations, relations. The weak of heart need not apply. Yet there are those that do not have relations nor know not who their relations are. Mr. Elton, I wonder if I might oblige you to do me a favor. Anything, Miss Woodhouse. For you, no favor is too great. <laughs> well, I've just had the pleasure of meeting a most engaging young woman. Her name is Harriet Smith. I wonder if I might encourage you to look after her this evening. I'm afraid she doesn't know a soul here. It would be my pleasure to perform so humble a service for you, Miss Woodhouse. Relations, mine are theoretical. Relations, my station hypothetical. The circumstance regrettable, my person undefined. Relations! They're always leaving you behind. Relations, complications, variations, of gradations. Relations! I wonder what became of mine. Emma! Then there are some relations that are just impossible to make sense of. Just received news that my brother and his family are going to Plymouth for the summer. Yes, I have just heard the same news. Since Mr. Knightley's brother is married to my sister, I'm not quite sure what that makes him to me. Relations! Related accidentally. Relations! A family fundamentally. Now that you've completed your education, Miss Smith, what are your plans? I'm hoping to spend the summer again with the Martins of Abbey Mill Farm. They rent the farm from Mr. Knightley, do they not? Yes, <laughs> Mr. Robert Martin speaks very highly of Mr. Knightley. I see you are getting acquainted with my new friend, Miss Smith. She is a dear. <laughs> Everyone in Highbury knows Miss Woodhouse. I have long admired her. It's an honor to finally have made your acquaintance. And it is my honor, Miss Smith, to introduce you to our new vicar, Mr. Elton. A pleasure, Miss Smith. Oh, yes, thank you. I, I mean, very much pleased to meet you very much as well. Thank you very much. Her grammar can be improved, but her hair is perfect. I see someone's been busy. I see someone's been watching. I always like to watch an artist at work, even an amateur one at that. So do you paint, Miss Woodhouse? I'm afraid not very well. To say the least. Well, 
I've been known to dabble a little myself. Perhaps I might persuade you to sit for me sometimes, Miss Wartart? Uh, I'm sure I would make a poor subject. But I dare say Miss Smith would be a most excellent model for your endeavours. Would you not agree, Mr Elton? Yes. <laughs> But might I suggest that Miss Woodhouse be the artist? With beauty such as that of Miss Smith, a more gifted hand is needed. <laughs> he likes her, she likes him. I could be a genius. He's proper, she's simple and charming. He's lonely, she's humble, I'm awed by my talent. He loves her, or is likely to, in time. They're absolutely perfect, I see them in the chapel. I see sunlight dapple upon her fair skin. I'll merely give her guidance, just make a small suggestion, so if he should ask the question, she'll know to say yes, for she will impress if I can finesse. So, you don't know who your parents are? I've no idea. So for all you know, you could be of royal blood. I've never thought of it like that. Your father, perhaps a lord or a viceroy. Or a musician. No, never a musician. Unless that is his hobby. Can you imagine a musician earning the respect of good society? <laughs> oh, no, I suppose not. The only other people I have ever known are the Martins. The Martins? Of Abbey Mill Farm, the farmers? <laughs> they have eight Cows. One, a little Welsh cow, a very pretty Welsh cow indeed. Charming. And then there is Mr. Martin. <laughs> Do you know, once he had gone three miles to bring me some walnuts just because he had heard that I was fond of them. Isn't that so very sweet? Heartbreaking. Miss Woodhouse, look. Mr. Martin! She's eager, he's common. She must be instructed. I'll make her a gentleman's daughter. I brought a bag of seed. Yes, I will improve her. I'll form her opinions, for she needs me more than she knows. <laughs> Isn't that the most wonderful coincidence? <laughs> I should say so. Uh, uh, what did you think of him? I had imagined him, I confess, a degree or two nearer gentility. I suppose he's not as genteel as a real gentleman. Precisely. He could never be as fine a gentleman as Mr. Knightley. Or have the openness or good humor as, say, Mr. Elton? Yes. I think I see that now. In fact, Mr. Elton asked after you the other day. Really? He did? She's easy to alter, so open and willing, so lucky to have me to guide her. Her taste is deficient, my work is enormous, but I am obliged to succeed the future Mrs. Elton, so beautiful and proper. Now nothing can stop her from marital bliss. And then I'll match another, a cousin or a brother. I'll match them with each other. No task is too great for anything goes. Why choose your role? Duty. 
and grateful disposition to be guided by myself. And she appears to be totally free of conceit. However does she manage it? Isn't it lovely? If only Jane were here. She is such an expert artist. I was just telling Mother the other day that no one has the artistic facility of Jane. She is quite the prodigy of painting. She paints, she writes poetry, she plays the pianoforte. There's hardly room for the rest of us to exhibit any skill at all. May I peek? Oh, patience, Mr. Elton, although I warn you, I am not a great artist. We shall see about that. Emma never submits to anything requiring industry and patience. Most of her portraits are incomplete, as far as I can tell. Well, that is because they were always of husbands and wives who I could not persuade to sit still with so many children about. Well, there are no husbands and wives here. At least, not yet. Very good, Emma. The expression of the eye is most correct. But Miss Smith has not those eyebrows nor eyelashes. She's going to catch her death of cold with only that little shawl. Oh, Papa, it's summer. She will not catch cold. But there is a draft. Papa. We shall all catch colds and die. I can't wait any longer. A miracle has happened. What a thing of wonder. This defies description, but in my opinion, a miracle has happened. Something so surprising Her beauty and your talent leave me circumspect and humble It is no less than genius A work of art And art has a habit of inhabiting the heart I agree A miracle has happened Someone sees your talent itself A revelation unimagined in my lifetime It's certainly a wonder and maybe I'm mistaken, but I don't think I've had enough to drink to see the genius. It's not a Da Vinci, or Raphael, or even in proportion, as far as I can tell. Absurd. She glows. She does not glow. More beautiful than a summer rose. How does that spot upon her nose? Her radiant eyes are perfectly. That is her news. Oh, what I'm looking at is strange and odd. And oh my God, did you cut off her ear? Well, perhaps just part of the ear. Miracles can happen, men can have dementia I'm overcome with happiness, I'm bursting with reluctance Miracles can happen, whatever your opinion It is my opinion that your eyesight is in question Art can be rewarding, if done with grace This looks to me more like Mr. Elton's face that's really very rude. The likeness is rather subdued. A miracle has happened. Let's hope that it's not reviewed. The longer I consider it, the more it appeals to me. Mr. Elton is the person I am most fixed on for Harriet. His situation is suitable, and I imagine he has a sufficient income, and he is much admired. Though not by me, but I've heard others say he's very well-meaning. Miss Woodhouse, you'll never guess what has happened. He has proposed. Already? Yes. <laughs> this is excellent news. 
dear man, a letter is a most respectable means of proposal. <laughs> This is from Mr. Robert Martin. Yes. I was rather under the assumption that the letter might be from Mr. Elton. Mr. Elton? No. I had not thought of that. Well, is it a good letter? Yes, a very good letter. His sister must have helped him. <gasps> what shall I do? Well, you must answer it, of course. But what shall I say? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, do advise me. Oh, I cannot give you my opinion, except to say that I would be disappointed if you were to say yes. Do not imagine that I want to influence you. I say this to you as a friend. So you think I should say no? I had no notion that he liked me so very much. Not for the world would I advise you either way. You must be the best judge of your own happiness. If you are absolutely sure that you prefer Mr. Martin to every other person in the world, if you think him the most agreeable man you have ever met or are likely ever to meet, then why should you hesitate? Miss Woodhouse, as you will not give me your opinion, I must do as well as I can by myself. And I have now quite determined and really almost made up my mind to refuse Mr. Martin. <laughs> Do you think that I am right? Oh, Harriet, now that you have come to this decision by yourself, I can tell you what I could not tell you before. Which is to say that you are perfectly right in refusing Mr. Martin. Oh, I am? Yes. And I would add, with no reservation of my own, that I would not be surprised if you were soon to get the same sort of letter from Mr. Elton. <laughs> <laughs> she refused him. That is my understanding. Well, the young man came to me for counsel. And while I had some apprehension about the girl being worthy of him, I, I dare say I approved the union. Now I see. She is a greater simpleton than I originally believed. Yes. It is always incomprehensible to a man that a woman should ever refuse an offer of marriage. He always imagines her to be ready for anybody who asks her. Nonsense. A man imagines no such thing. But what is the meaning of this? Harriet Smith refusing Robert Martin? No, madness. I hope you are mistaken. I saw her answer. Nothing could be clearer. You saw her answer. You mean you wrote her answer. This is your doing, isn't it, Emma? What if it is? Um. I do not feel I have done wrong. Mr. Martin is a very respectable young man, but he is not Harriet's equal. Not her equal? She's the natural daughter of nobody. She's lucky for him, pity's sake. She's the natural daughter of nobody. All she can hope for is someone to love her. Is that such a tragic mistake? Though she is pretty and somewhat endearing, I beg you to listen and stop interfering and do not infer that because she's your friend, he's not worthy of her. What? You think a farmer a good match for my intimate friend? Oh, Mr. Martin may be the richer of the two, but he is undoubtedly her inferior in rank in society. <laughs> you are so naive. Impossibly misguided And even worse, immune to common sense I know you, Emma, and if you dare perceive She'll marry Mr. Elton You are more deranged than I believe really He will not be in love With someone unendowed with Relation, rank, and property To say nothing of some wit He will not be in love but what is truly sad, because of you, your friend may lose what hope of love she had. I don't care to hear your opinion. No, I'm sure you don't, but I cannot acquit you, though I take no pleasure in my scorn. And yes, it's oddly true, Miss Smith and Mr. Martin can live out their lives without the help of you. For your friend is in love. 
And though you have not deemed it or dreamed it or approved of it, that doesn't make it wrong. Yes, your friend is in love. But what is truly sad, because of you, your friend may lose what hope of love she had. I don't know what you mean. I think you do. I never interfered. I don't believe you, Emma. You think you know my mind? I do know your mind. The perfect Mr. Knightley. Emma. Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. You think you know it all, but sadly you're mistaken. You simply have no insight to the heart of intellect and poise with no romantic feeling, just temper, faulty platitudes and noise. You have not been in love, therefore you can scold me or lecture me or badger me. It is not your place, you have not been in love, and so I must declare that you are not to say a word. A word's exactly what you need. A syllable. A reprimand. An utterance. Admonishment. On a, a subject, subject of which you will never fully be aware. Did you not see the way he was looking at you? <laughs> I did not particularly notice that Mr. Elton was looking at me. That's why it is so fortunate that I am here to notice these things for you. <laughs> Miss Woodhouse, I do so wonder that you should not be married, or going to be married, so charming as you are. You are very kind, Harriet. But yes, it is a paradox. Hot field, nice touch, large frame. Some things are best left unseen. Harriet, in spite of my lack of talent, your beauty fills the room. <laughs> Would you not agree, Mr. Elton? On the contrary, Miss Woodhouse. It is your supreme skill that allows the charm and grace of Miss Smith to emerge from the canvas in such a wondrous fashion. <laughs> I think I'll go have a brandy. Perhaps I'll join you, Mr. Knightley. Harriet, why don't you keep Mr. Elton occupied? I don't understand. Is this a portrait of someone we know? You're not fooling anyone, you know. Please, will you never give me the chance of being right? Must I always be in the wrong? Dear Emma, please, just stop our quarreling and become friends again, shall we? Yes, this is what I'd hoped you'd say. <laughs> we mustn't stay enemies. I agree completely. However, I must say a word or two more on the subject of which we last spoke. Must you? As far as good intentions go, we were both right, but I dare say I have yet to be proved wrong. I only want to know that Mr. Martin is not very bitterly disappointed. No man was ever more so. Well then, for that I am sorry. Come, shake hands with me. Oh, it looks as though Mr. Elton and Miss Smith are discussing something quite intimate. To be perfectly honest and candid, Miss Smith, I myself prefer beetroot to celery. <laughs> I always have. Beetroot is excellent for one's digestion if it is not too fibrous. Ah, <laughs> the eloquence of lovers. Emma, <laughs> we have news. A letter came from Frank this morning. Is this true? He will be with us in the fortnight. <gasps> I am not yet convinced that his aunt can spare him. Oh, he will come. This time I'm sure of it. You are both hopeful, but I fear Mrs. Churchill's poor health will delay the journey yet again. Fred not, Mrs. Weston. This time will be different, you'll see. The idea of Frank Churchill has always interested me. If I were ever to marry, he is the very person to suit me in age, character, and condition. The esteemed Frank Churchill. The esteemed Frank Churchill. A very good-looking and dashing and noble young man. He was raised by Mr. Weston's sister, and for reasons nobody can understand, he took her name. She seems to have brought him up with the intention of never letting him go. The 
esteemed Frank Churchill. I have dreamed Frank Churchill. And yes, I have sworn against marriage, but frankly for him, I could alter my plan. And though we've never met, my world is at his feet. I'm likely to like him. He's likely to like me. We're likely to be happy. Should we ever meet? The esteemed Frank Churchill. The esteemed Frank Churchill. Oh, why has he never decided to come for a stay? I invent Frank Churchill. I lament Frank Churchill. Oh, doesn't he know there's a person who's here he will come to adore and obey? And because we've never met, his life is not complete. He's likely to like me. I'm likely to like him. We're likely to be happy should we ever meet. He thinks his life is perfect. He thinks he's wild and free. But that's because in all He's not encountered me, but something soon to change, a most practical conceit. I'm likely to like him, he's likely to like me, we're likely to be happy, positively happy. Ah, Miss Woodhouse. Mr. Elton. I thought I might find you here, alone. You startled me, I was No, Miss Woodhouse, saying... I cannot contain myself any longer. Mr. Elton? I have waited in agony to have this intimate moment with you. Well, I beg your pardon, we are not having an intimate moment. I don't know where to begin. My pulse is racing, my heart is beating so fast. I'm, I'm like a schoolboy. <laughs> and behaving like one, I might add. Miss Woodhouse? Emma? Surely by now you have guessed my feelings towards you, how deeply I am in love with you and have been in love with you ever since the first moment I beheld you here at Hartfield. Please say you will be my wife and make me the happiest man on earth. Say I will be blessed with your eternal obedience. Mr. Elton, I fear you have had a little too much to drink. <laughs> yes, I am drunk. Drunk with love, passionate, unequaled love for you. Well, I am very much astonished, Mr. Elton. You are confusing your affection for me with Miss Smith. I would be happy to deliver any message you might have for her. Miss Smith? What have I to do with Miss Smith when Miss Woodhouse, the very core of my affection, is standing so close to my soul? Mr. Elton, your soul is mistaken. I have repeatedly witnessed your affection for my dear friend, Miss Smith. Good heavens, I have never once thought of Miss Smith but as your friend. Never cared whether she were dead or alive. You never thought of Miss Smith? Well, she's a very good sort of girl. And no doubt there are men who might not object to... Well, we all have our level. Oh. Dear. No, madam, my visits to Hartfield have been for you and you only. Well, I'm exceedingly sorry, Mr. Elton, but it is well that the mistake ends where it does. Are you saying you have no feelings for me? I cannot believe that. <laughs> Mr. Elton, the sort of feelings I have for you now would be best not expressed. So I take that to mean you do not return my love. No, I do not. I see. Oh, such an overthrow of everything I had been wishing for. And such a blow to Harriet. Well, at least I convinced her not to accept Mr. Robert Martin. There I was quite right. But there I should have stopped and left the rest to time and chance. Oh, the absurd Mr. Elton. 
By my word, Mr. Elton, a silly, detestable, odious, horrible man. What made him think that he could hope to marry me? Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield profoundly rejects you. For someone else expects you to. was grossly mistaken, Harriet, and for that I cannot be forgiven. Please, Miss Woodhouse. In truth of fact, I did not think I deserved a man as distinguished as... Mr. Elton! Oh, <laughs> dear Harriet. I am convinced that of the two of us, you are the superior creature. My one consolation is there is no necessity for anybody's knowing what has passed except the three principles. That is a cheering thought. And the weather is quite favorable for a visit with our dear friend, Miss Bates. This is certain to lift Harriet's spirits. Oh, unfortunately, that means an encounter with the one woman I most dislike in the world, Jane Fairfax. Miss Woodhouse, Miss Smith, do have some cake. Mother hardly ate any breakfast at all this morning. Just one small slice of bread without hardly any butter. And for dinner, I dare say, she had but a small piece of mutton. A piece of mutton, Mother! When did you arrive, Miss Fairfax? Just yesterday afternoon, Miss Woodhouse. My aunt was so kind to take me in. And she plans to stay indefinitely. I cannot put my finger on exactly why I dislike Miss Fairfax. Mr. Knightley thinks it's because I see in her the accomplished young woman I might be myself. <laughs> Jane did not grow up with your advantages, Emma. She has no fortune. She depends upon our kindness. Well, she rarely comes to Highbury. And when she does, there's always such a fuss made about her. She might learn from others the value of being humble. Think of a situation. Parents lost, raised by a family friend whose fortune would go to his only son. Well, when you put it that way... You would do well to learn from her example. We never were so long without seeing Jane before. And as I was telling Mother, we hardly know how to make enough of her now. I hear you have not been well, Miss Fairfax. Yes, a slight cold. There will be no more trips to the post office in the rain. But I am almost recovered now. Mm. Sweet Jane, her superiority in both beauty and accomplishments cannot be unfelt by those around her. Mother, do not eat that fig. Do you not agree, Miss Woodhouse? Far be it for those with lesser charm and beauty to speculate, Miss Bates. She is a wonder. Charming and poised, she seems to flutter, singing and painting flawlessly. She prefers French to German, but her Latin is unrivaled, to be sure. How many of her gifts must we endure? Have a piece of cake, mother, isn't it a treat? Jane is here to stay, let's everybody eat. Have a little port, mother, mustn't go to waste. Jane is our guest, drink up, make haste. If only I could bear the after. Miss Woodhouse, your father was so kind to send over the hind quarter yesterday. Hartfield pork is unlike any other pork, but it is still pork. Mrs. Cole likes it nicely fried. Oh, and speaking of Mrs. Cole, she just received a letter from guess who? Mr. Elton, he is in Bath. Oh, what a life he must be living. Oh, what a man he's come to be. One lucky lady will be his, a woman with a rather large estate. One can only hope she takes the bait. Have a piece of cake, mother, I can see him there. Conversing with the princess, slim and debonair. Must I eat that big mother, I can see him now. The baron and his daughter slowly bow. I can almost hear the wedding fall. <laughs> oh, Miss, don't be distressed. Mother does not digest figs well. <laughs> Miss Fairfax, I hear you have been in Weymouth at the same time as Mr. Frank Churchill. Are you acquainted with him? 
a little acquainted with him. Having never met him myself, I am curious. Is he handsome? I believe he is considered a very fine young man. Is he agreeable? He's generally thought so. Is he sensible? Is he a man of information? It is difficult to decide on such points. I believe everyone finds his manners pleasing. What a pristine, annoying creature. What a stupendous, icy stare. Beautiful, yes, but something's lurking. I don't really want to know what's there. What a little minx. Visitors beware. She's distant and boring. I don't like her day dress. And she's not a gentleman's daughter. I cannot improve her or form her opinions, for she seems to have none of her own. And I don't like her intention. She stirs my apprehension. She's stubborn in her repartee. And snobbery and arrogance only look good on me. Mr. Elton is to be married? Yes, Papa. Indeed, there is no end to the sad consequences of happy couples. This time I'm inclined to agree with you. But you were once happy and married yourself. Can you not be happy now for others? No, I cannot. I don't like change. Yes, Papa. Are you sure you will never marry, my dear? Of course not. I would never leave you. That's what your sister said just before she married Mr. Knightley's brother. Where is Whittos? What do you think has happened? I thought I should have fainted. I may faint still. Harriet, what is it? Uh, well, I set out for Hartfield not an hour ago when it really started to pour down. So I stepped inside Ford's and took shelter in the shop. I sat there for a few minutes waiting for the rain to subside. And all of a sudden, who do you suppose should come in? Miss Elizabeth Martin and her brother. Then they notice me and Miss Elizabeth Martin turns away while I keep sitting by the door. Waiting for the rain to stop, I never felt so miserable and positively mortified when Miss Elizabeth Martin stands before me, puts her hand out cordially. I was all in a tremble, can't remember what we talked about. But then he slowly ambled over to me. I could feel my pulses racing. I don't know what happened next, but Mr. Robert Martin spoke to me, but I don't hear one word he said. I, I, I mean, well. But he seemed so nice. Mr. Robert Martin stood with me while we conversed most pleasantly. A Brumio nail. What is your advice? Isn't he lovely? Isn't he charming and kind and good natured and polite? Isn't he? Even with dirt on his face, he has such an air of grace. Well, now. Don't you agree? Yes, Miss Elizabeth Martin and her brother are quite humble, I agree. Now there's no need to dwell on what has passed. Let's look for what the future brings. Bring a thousand things. Yes, it could bring a thousand things, but oh, the way he looks so nervous. Mr. Robert Martin bowed his head, and then he said goodbye to me. Goodbye. There in all the rain, Mr. Robert Martin and his sister walked away so silently. Not a lovely I have 
have some news. Are they sort charming and kind and good natured and polite? Would you not like to hear my news? Even with it on his face, he has such an air. Will you listen, please? If I could finish this sentence, you'd see. Sorry. Mr. Elton is to be married. Now, I know this might be distressing for the moment, but in time, your heart and your pride will fully recover. I see. Well, that is news. Pity I did not hear of it sooner. For then, I could have mentioned it in my conversation with Mr. Robert Martin as we stood there talking like no time had passed. Oh, Merely like a dream, Mr. Robert Martin holds his head up even when his heart's distressed. Such a decent I'm sure Miss Woodhouse knows what's best. Yes. Mr. Frank Churchill's arrival in Highbury continued to be a figment of everyone's imagination. Mrs. Weston was exceedingly disappointed, even more so than Mr. Weston, as she saw nothing but a repetition of excuses and delays. But then, everything wore a different air, and the morning of an interesting day arrived. Emma, I told you he would be here. May I present to you my son, Mr. Frank Churchill. Miss Woodhouse, the last we meet. Mr. Churchill, what a pleasure. I was beginning to think you did not exist. Oh, I was beginning to think the same ill. I felt immediately that I should like him. I have heard your name spoken so often, I feel as though we are already old friends. Well, I hope that we can now make such promise possible. And perhaps you'd be kind enough to show me around Ivory. I would indeed. Oh. Shall we? With pleasure. How I have longed for this day. My dearest friend and my husband's son. <laughs> That's very well stated, Mrs. Weston. <laughs> Why, thank you, Mr. Weston. Oh. Am I wrong in indulging in the hope of the two of them together? Well, perhaps. But what harm could come of it? Miss Woodhouse, what is this place? That's Ford's, first in size and fashion. To be a citizen of Highbury, you must buy something at Ford's. No, then I must make myself its most frequent patron while I'm here. Well, you'll have to compete with Mrs. Weston for that honor. <laughs> but tell me, what do you think of Jane Fairfax? Did you see her often in Weymouth? I saw her a little. I dare say you answer as discreetly as she herself. She, she always seemed a bit too pale for my liking. She rather looks like she's ill, a most deplorable complexion. Oh, tish, tish. <laughs> now there, I would not agree. Let's just say she's not your taste. But do you admire her, aside from her complexion? <laughs> I cannot separate Miss Fairfax from her complexion. <laughs> she was always so reserved, I could somehow never attach myself to uh, her. It is a most repulsive quality. It has a safety in reserve, but uh, never attraction. Miss Woodhouse, what is that? That's the Crown Inn. It used to be a ballroom. Now it's merely a gentleman's club. I'm afraid there are not enough young people in Highbury to inspire dancing. Oh, then we'll just have to inspire dancing ourselves. Mr. Churchill, you speak as if you intend to stay. I'm finding reasons to extend my visit here at every moment. It feels like hell. The air is warm. It takes my Like her, the sky. 
sky is wide, the people quaint. My heart is lifted, for here I walk in streets of morning dew. For here I pleasure of meeting the esteemed Frank Churchill. Yes, now there's a gentleman. Perfect manners, perfect looks. I've tried, but I can't find fault with him. Really? I heard he rode all the way to London just to have his hair cut. <laughs> just a silly, trifling fellow I took him for, but I suppose you approve of such foppery and nonsense. I see no point in discussing it. We shall never agree. <laughs> that is nothing extraordinary. Have you heard? Mr. Knightley sent a carriage for Jane Fairfax and Miss Bates. Mr. Knightley is a gentleman. He was simply acting appropriately. The more I think of it, the more probable it appears. The more probable what appears? It is my belief that Mr. Knightley is infatuated with Jane Fairfax and she with him. Nonsense! No, he's a committed bachelor. Oh, perhaps, but I stand by my claim. See the consequence of your company? Oh, my dear Mrs. Weston, do not take to matchmaking. You do it very ill. Emma, might you favor us with some music? Yes. <laughs> Surely you would prefer to ask another guest without the limitations of my musical prowess. Well, we could always ask Miss Fairfax to play. Oh, I suppose I could indulge this one small request. <laughs> Well, I played it perfectly yesterday. Sweet sister Mary, golden hair, she walks in fields of proud red roses. Sweet sister Mary takes my hand. What is he saying to Jane Fairfax? I wish I had some talent. Why is she leaning on him? Is this a match? I hate my voice. I wish I'd worn my floral bonnet. I could hide my utter shame. Sweet sister Mary, golden hair. The sunlight glistens all around her. He's so attentive and perhaps he finds me charming. Fair and modest. And it's appealing, I admit. An attachment to him, why should I not indulge in the thought? Clearly he finds me irresistible and holds me in esteem. Why is she standing up? Good God, she's coming over here. She's playing now.
can't want a wife. He's not the type. Then why is he looking at her? Why am I looking at him? Looking at her? Oh, she plays well, does she not? Only if you enjoy that polished, extremely gifted sort of talent. Ella, why do you so dislike her? I do not dislike her. We have simply chosen not to form an attachment to her. One can never guess what she's thinking. Yes, I know the feeling. Sweet sister Mary tries my patience. It's not her fault you play so poorly. Mr. Robert Martin and his sister cross my mind so frequently. I have quite enough praise for Miss Fairfax. But we never speak. Her voice is Mr. Lovely. Robert Martin and his sister do not pay much mind to me. It feels like I wonder her. what they think. It feels Are they like My heart is lifted, for here I stand with friends and family, and here I stand with you. He likes me, I'm certain he pays such attention for I am a gentleman's daughter we all need a partner and I'm no exception I just didn't know one till now love is in magic it amazes and surprises what fate improves But will I resist? I dare not rebel If he is my fate Then I might as well And yes, other people's pleasure Will always be my leisure But why bear such pleasure? like to make should rightly be Um, oh, I've been longing to tell you all about the preparations for our ball. Ah, yes, I, I wanted to speak to you uh, about the ball. 
My aunt is unwell and urges my return to London. Oh, how horrid. I mean, for your aunt. <laughs> I suppose our poor ball must be quite given up. Uh, only for a short time. And perhaps I'll return in the fall. May I ask, Mr. Churchill, might you have arrived sooner had you known how much you would have enjoyed the company of the people of Highbury? A great deal sooner if I had realized how much I would have enjoyed the company of one very particular person in Highbury. Miss Woodhouse. Surely you can read my intentions. I'm not sure I can, Mr. Churchill. Miss Woodhouse, I must make a confession to you. Must you? These last few weeks, you must know the joy I feel being in the presence of someone you hold dear, someone you long to oh, tell. Look who it is, Mr. Weston. We, we were just speaking of you. I'm afraid it's a time to go, son. Miss Woodhouse, it seems that fate has conspired against us. At least for now. He was more in love with me than I thought. He was about to tell me so when his father burst in. And I suppose that I must in turn be in love with him. This sensation of listlessness, stupidity, this dull disinclination to sit down and employ myself. So this is how love feels. Quiet, pensive, most polite. And I don't have a fever, I'm perfectly calm. I didn't think it would feel like that. But this is how love feels. No surprises but to say. I am somewhat surprised to be fully composed. I expected perhaps to be more indisposed. This is how love feels And though there are no lightning bolts To paint my sky No waves to crash my shore I am quite enough in love And most content And I should not want for more No, I should not want for more <laughs> So this is how love feels even tempered quietude, there is nothing unusual stirring in me. I didn't think it would feel like that, but this is how love feels. Not like any poet's verse, although Byron insisted that love was a curse, and Shakespeare's young lovers had fates even worse. This is how love feels. And it would be completely strange and more than odd for my heart not to soar. Therefore, I must be in love, there is no doubt. And I should not want for more. No, I should not want for This more. must be how love feels, so uplifting, so inspired. Her careful composure, her elegant shape, the depth of her beauty leaves my mouth agape. This must be how love feels. Her nuances awaken me, delight my eye. When will she be my bride? If only we could tell the world how much we feel. Then we would not have to hide a love that's been denied. Hello, Miss Smith. Mr. Martin. I, I, pardon, I, I, I was just. I, would no, see I didn't mean it. I, I, yes. I was only. <laughs> oh. No rain. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Quite pleasant, actually. Last time we spoke, 
uh, there was there was rain. Oh, yes, I recall. Oh, I uh, I read that Pride and Prejudice. <sighs> Don't recommend it. Thank you. Oh, uh, Walnut. Oh, how very kind indeed. I, I remembered you was fond of him. Oh. I have only grown more so. Mr. Robert Martin always says the sweetest things when chance we meet. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm. Isn't he a dear? <coughs> Mr. Robert Martin cannot have my hand, but has to. Still remains unclear, but I trust Miss Woodhouse. Her... She is my mentor and friend. She would not lead me astray. It's always so nice to see Miss your face. She even waited on his face. He has such an air of grace. I mean, Miss Smith. But she does not agree. Mrs. Elton was first seen in church. A thousand vexatious thoughts entered my mind as I prepared myself to meet the woman who thought it a good idea to marry Mr. Elton. One hears she is very well satisfied with herself and thinks much of her own importance. Oh, Miss Woodhouse! I'm so happy to finally make her acquaintance. Mr. E has spoken of you often. Mrs. Elton, I cannot express my anticipation of meeting you at last. We are so delighted to welcome you to Highbury. Oh, yes, I have heard it said on more than one occasion that my particular charms are of benefit to any community of high standing. Vanity must always be forgiven, you know, because there is no hope of a cure. Mother sends her regrets, and she'll be so sorry to have missed the opportunity to make a fuss over Mr. E's new bride. Please do not make a fuss on my behalf. I am simply enjoying the modest attentions that come from being an elegant and beautiful wife. <laughs> she is a rare jewel, is she not? Please do not make a fuss in front of the others, Mr. E. They must come to recognize my amenities on their own. <laughs> I believe we are beginning to see them now, Mrs. Elton. <laughs> Ghastly woman. Who invited her? Miss Fairfax, I hear you have been seeking employment. I shall endeavor to find you a situation. <laughs> oh, you needn't bother on my account, Mrs. Elton. Uh, nonsense. I shall take you under my wing and make you my pet. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Elton, but that is hardly necessary. I think Miss Fairfax is quite right. Shall we have some brandy? Uh, night, Lear. I hear Fox Hill is famous for its strawberry beds. Oh, in such weather for exploring. <laughs> Not until spring, I should think. Name your day. You may depend upon me to arrange everything. Married women, you know, may be safely authorized to invite the guests. Mrs. So Elton, there is but one married woman in the world I would ever allow to invite guests to my estate. Mrs. Weston, I suppose? No, Mrs. Knightley. And until she is in being, I shall manage such matters myself. <laughs> 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 Good news. Frank is returning to Highbury. <laughs> I'll rejoice. My sister thinks London too cold for her, so they are to move south for the season without any loss of time. Emma, perhaps now we can have our ball. Uh, uh, yes, yes, splendid idea. May I dare say, in honor of the new addition to Highbury? In any case, I'm sure we will all be glad to see Frank again. <laughs> Strange. His absence seems to have produced in me a kind of indifferent effect. The esteemed Frank Churchill. I have dreamed Frank Churchill. And yet, in the end, I don't care if I see him or not. 
I don't want Frank Churchill. I don't love Frank Churchill. I thought that I did, but I don't even like him a lot. Oh, Mr. Woodhouse, this is brilliant indeed. Excellently contrived upon my word. This is like meeting quite in fairyland. Yes, the fairyland had a draught. Did we not succeed in enlivening this stuffy old hall? I myself am quite impressed with our efforts. You do know how to throw a party, Emma, I will give you that. It's not a party, it's a ball. I call it what you like, it's still gonna be a dull evening. You're not planning on being difficult tonight, are you? It's my right to be difficult. I dislike small talk and I detest dancing. It is a testament to our friendship that I'm even here. Dancing is an art, Nightly. I'm sure you would look very gentlemanly and graceful if you ever took the trouble. Complete waste of time. Oh, what's a waste of time, pray tell? Hmm. Haircuts. Miss Woodhouse, I declare you have outdone yourself. Mr. Churchill, Highbury is honored to have you with us tonight. Well, it is indeed another opportunity to become acquainted with its inhabitants. Well, there is one new inhabitant that you have no doubt heard spoken of. Oh, yes, I do admit to having a great curiosity to meet Mrs. Elton. She's like no other, I assure you. Oh, which one is she? She's there, standing with Jane Fairfax. Who would have thought I would feel sorry for her? Well, perhaps I should stroll over and introduce myself. I'm sure Miss Fairfax wouldn't mind an interruption in the conversation. And then, Miss Woodhouse, I shall return and make good on my promise of a dance. I shall be waiting. <laughs> Poor lad. He is obviously still quite in love with me, while my own attachment has subsided into a mere nothing. A great success, don't you think? Well, not entirely. Harriet is still the only girl without a partner. Oh, yes, poor thing. I'm sure she will be asked. Oh, disaster if she is not. Then allow me to ease your worries. I know a person who is quite suitable to be Harriet's partner, at least for one dance. Another dance, Mr. Elton? It would give me very great pleasure to dance with an old friend such as yourself, Mrs. Weston. I am not referring to myself, Mr. Elton, but there is a young lady disengaged whom I should very much like to see dancing. Miss Smith. Miss Smith? Oh. I had not observed. You are extremely obliging, Mrs. Weston. And if I were not an old married man, I could accommodate her. I'm sure. But I'm afraid I've already committed to another partner. If you'll excuse me. Insufferable man! Harriet is too good for him. Oh, too good for us all. She is my superior in warmth and kindness. At least I know she will carry her disappointment with grace and dignity. What a pathetic, embarrassing, pitiful sight. Humiliation, but other than that, it's a beautiful night. For throwing yourself into cold, freezing water to do. I'm somewhat unbearably horrified standing alone. Humiliation, still a delightful crowd. Is that my way and Shandon? I'll drink the whole bottle and vomit on somebody's gun. La, 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 la. Shame. Disgrace and rejection can taint a woman's complexion, reducing her romantic chances. And there she stands and waits, but never dances. Humiliation, is it just me or is everyone looking my way? 
passion, but other than wanting to die, it's a lovely soiree. And aside from the anguish and torment, I've had a good time. La, la, la. I thought you said dancing was a waste of time. I was provoked. Your dancing proved to be just what I believed. Both graceful and elegant. Well, unpardonable rudeness on Mr. Elton's part. I do own myself to have been completely mistaken in Mr. Elton. There is littleness about him which you discovered and which I did not. <laughs> Well, in turn for you acknowledging so much, I will do you the justice to say that you would have chosen for him better than he has chosen for himself. <laughs> <laughs> and Harriet Smith has some first-rate qualities that Mrs. Elton is totally without. Come, let us go back. And with whom will you be dancing next? With you, if you will ah. ask me. We are not really so much brother and sister as to make it all improper. <laughs> Indeed. They are not. I know it's not improper for us to dance. It hardly is a scandal. Miss Bates has no opinion. And though we are related by circumstance, you are not my sister, and I'm sure and I'm your brother. Though my brother and your sister have three children, it's confusing. Emma, I'm helpless in your grace. I see your kindred face when I close my eyes. Emma, the dawn breaks with your smile. And for just a while, I am comforted. And if I never hold you, if I never touch you, if I never have the chance to quite express what I most hope for love in, I will never, I will never know love. You don't want me to marry, yet show no sign of anything but fondness for the friend you've known the longest. And yes, I'm slightly wary to cross that line. For what if it upset you, it would stain my pride forever And I don't know what you'd say or how you'd act Would it be foolish? Emma, the heart wants what it wants And it haunts me constantly when I'm with you Emma, my soul lies at your feet I have been discreet, but now I'm overdue and if I never hold you, if I never touch you, if I never have the chance to quite express what I'm most hopeful of, then I will never, I will never know love. You'll never know joy. You'll never know what it's like to stroke your hair and feel your skin against my skin. What is this? For a while, I am comforted. And
and if I never hold you, if I never touch you, if I never have the chance to quite express what I'm most hopeful of, then I will never. Miss Woodhouse! Uh, Mr. Churchill, uh, Harriet! What has happened? She oh. fainted, but I think she's nearly recovered oh, now. Dear. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, it was terrible. Awful. What has happened? I was taking the road to Richmond when I was suddenly and most inconveniently attacked by gypsies. How ghastly. Oh. If not for the miraculous and completely coincidental passing by of Mr. Churchill, I fear that something dreadful could have become of my person. No, they were children, actually. Uh, probably looking for ribbons. Villainous little creatures. Oh, dear. Oh, oh thank you, Mr. Churchill. Oh, thank you. Whatever can I do to repay such an act of chivalry and kindness? <laughs> He likes her, she likes him. I could be a genius. They're perfect and simply I... No, I have had enough of interference. I shall not stir a step nor drop a hint. <laughs> if you'll excuse me, ladies. Oh, Mr. Churchill. Oh! Miss Woodhouse! <sighs> For all we have been through, I feel it is my duty to have no reserves with you on a particular subject. Mr. Elton. Oh, I assure you, I shall shed no more tears for him. I can see nothing at all extraordinary in him now. Oh, yes, Miss Woodhouse. I am quite an altered creature. And this is the last I shall speak of Mr. D the Vicar of Highbury. Oh, Harriet, I am sure that when you do marry, you will be fully appreciated for the delightful creature you are. I shall never marry. Never marry? Well, this is a new resolution. It is one that I shall never change. I hope it is not in compliment to Mr. The Vicar. Mr. Elton? No, indeed. He is so superior to Mr. Elton. He? <gasps> I've already said too much. I believe I can guess your meaning. The person whom you would prefer to marry might be too greatly your superior to think of you. Is this not so? Oh, Miss Woodhouse! Oh, believe me, I have not the presumption to suppose he would be at all attached to me. But it is a pleasure to admire him at a distance. I am not at all surprised. The service he rendered you was enough to warm your heart. Oh, the very recollection of it. When I saw him coming, his noble look and my wretchedness before. In one moment, such a change from perfect misery to perfect happiness. Uh, but I'm not so mad as to believe he has a thought of me. Oh, Harriet. More wondrous things have taken place. There have been matches of greater disparity. Miracles have happened. Stranger things have happened. Love can be surprising, abrupt and unexpected. Miracles have happened. Stranger things have happened. Cressida and Troilus found love without allowance. Truth is stranger than fiction. There is no blame. Let's make a promise not to speak his name. And yes, there are objections, obstacles abounding. He is quite your better. Would he make concessions? But if he should grow to love you, it would not be surprising. Men can be persuaded, 
miracles can happen. We can all choose our partners. There is no blame. Let's make a promise not to speak his name. I give you caution now. Make sure that his love is returned to you. But I pledge I shall never discuss this again, for I swear I'm determined against all interference and oath for which there must be adherence. For we have been mistaken, in the past we were mistaken, but now we both know better. We just mind our business, but if he should grow to love you, it would not be surprising. Newton learned the earth. Galileo saw the heavens Still, what are the chances? We can't explain Let's make a promise Not to ruminate Or over-speculate Things that just happen by fate For miracles can happen We don't take them Well, Miss Woodhouse, I was quite determined to return to London until you invited me to come today. Well, I'm glad you choose to be with us, Mr. Churchill. Well, I'm here because you commanded me to be here and for no other reason. It is best to believe your temper under your own commandment and not mine. Oh, it comes to the same thing, does it not? Harriet, why don't you keep Mr. Churchill occupied? Oh, I'm quite content sitting beside Mr. Knightley, thank you. And I beside Miss Woodhouse. And are you quite comfortable in your current seat of location, Miss Fairfax? Oh, yes, Mr. Churchill, quite. Thank you so much for inquiring. Oh, no, not at all. But perhaps you yourself are not as comfortable as you appear. Nor is any man, Miss Fairfax. Mr. Knightley, you are always being humble. That can be so tedious. Well, I have news. My good friend, Mrs. Suckling, offers our dear Jane a desirable position as governess, which I think shall suit her quite well. I am wild for the offer. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Elton, but at present I am still not inclined to pursue any offers of employment. I am quite happy in my present state. Nonsense, Jane. Offers such as the one from Mrs. Suckling do not appear every day. It appears that your kind offer is unaccepted, Mrs. Elton, and I say that in utter indifference to Mrs. Suckling. Mr. E., what have you to say on my behalf? A most delightful frock, my dear. I assure you, Mrs. Elton, I am quite content. How content she must be to form such a close alliance with Mr. Knightley. Miss Woodhouse, isn't Jane fortunate to receive the kindness and affection of Mr. Knightley? Perhaps Mr. Knightley would like to express these affections himself. Emma. Oh, well, if we are truly speaking of our affections, then I would like to express mine for Miss Woodhouse. Mr. Churchill. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, oh, what's that, Miss Woodhouse? Oh, no. A game? Oh, very well, if you insist. Miss Woodhouse demands from each of you either one thing very clever, or uh, two things moderately clever, <laughs> or three things very dull indeed. And she engages to laugh heartily at them all. I have demanded nothing of the sort. These sorts of things are very well at Christmas, but quite out of place in the summer. Do you not agree, Mr. E? I do, indeed. Although, I've always rather enjoyed games in summer. But, of course, not this summer. <laughs> oh, very well. Three things very dull indeed. That will just do for me, you know. I shall be sure to say three dull things as soon as ever I open my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Shan't I? <laughs> do you not all think I shall? <laughs> ah, but there may be a difficulty, Miss Bates, as you will be limited to only three in number. <laughs> See what she means. 
I must try to hold my tongue. I must make myself very disagreeable, or she would not have said such a thing to an old friend. It was not so very bad. I dare say she did not understand me. I assure you, she did. She felt your full meaning. I know there is not a better creature in the world as Miss Bates. But you must allow that what is good and what is ridiculous are most unfortunately blended in her. Were she a woman of fortune, I would leave her every harmless absurdity to take its own chance. But her situation should have secured your compassion, Emma. It was badly done. Why am I surprised? I've been fooled before. He was still a child. It was badly done. And what makes it worse? You should have known better. You. Should have known better. Miss Woodhouse, good afternoon, Miss Fairfax. I was hoping your aunt might spare me a moment. I have something I wish to say to her. I'm afraid she and Mrs. Bates have gone to the coals. Oh, do come in. Well, oh, please, Miss Woodhouse. I'm quite glad you're here, Miss Woodhouse. In truth, there is something I wish to tell you. Before you say anything, Miss Fairfax. No, please, I must. I believe I can guess what it is you wish to say. Miss Woodhouse? I admit to being ashamed of my conduct towards you. Oh. Miss Woodhouse, I merely meant to give you news. News? Mrs. Churchill has died. Frank has just returned to London. Oh, dear. Oh, I am sorry. Yes, well, I'm afraid that is not the news to which I am referring. No. Miss Woodhouse, Mr. Churchill and I are engaged to be married. <laughs> so sorry. I thought I just heard you say that you and Mr. Churchill were engaged to be married. We have been secretly long engaged. Only the passing of his aunt has made it possible for us to reveal our engagement. So it is I who must apologize to you, Miss Woodhouse, especially on behalf of Mr. Churchill. Indeed. I am stunned. That is, many little matters are laid open. I've been in agony, Miss Woodhouse. I long to tell you, to tell anyone. But Mrs. Churchill was such a proud woman. She would never approve our union. Oh, my dear Miss Fairfax, I can now imagine how I must have appeared in your eyes when all this time I thought you to be my rival. I had always hoped we might choose to become better acquainted, Miss Woodhouse. We have known each other from children to women. And now as friends. <laughs> oh, she's not so terribly bad. Perhaps a little happiness is due her, after all. It feels like her. It feels like her. The air is warm. My heart is full. The, the sky is, is wide. wide. My spirit. to Jane Fairfax? It is not possible. My very words, exactly. Oh, I cannot believe it. Those were my words as well. Well, I 
hope that they shall be quite happy together. <laughs> oh. Had you any idea? You who can see into everybody's heart. How can you ask me that question? When it was I who was encouraging you to give way to your own feelings. You may be very sure that should I have known, I would have cautioned you accordingly. Me? Why should you caution me? You do not think that I care about Frank Churchill? Do you mean to deny it? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, how could you mistake me? Oh, I know we agreed never to name him. <laughs> but considering how infinitely superior he is to everyone else, I should not have thought it possible that I could be supposed to mean... Frank Churchill? Well, whom do you mean? Oh, it is you who have encouraged me. At first, I could not believe such an attachment possible. But... Stranger things have happened. That is what you told me. Harriet, let us understand each other now without the possibility of further mistake. Are you speaking of Mr. Knightley? <laughs> <laughs> to be sure I am. Oh, my dear Harriet, I perfectly remember speaking of your wonderment at the service Mr. Churchill rendered you. The sensation you felt when he rescued you. My dear Miss Woodhouse, it was not the gypsies to which I was referring. <gasps> no, I was thinking of a much more precious circumstance, of Mr. Knightley's coming and asking me to dance when Mr. Elton would not stand up with me. That was the service which made me begin to feel how superior he was to every other person in the world. Good God, this has been a most unfortunate, most deplorable mistake. What is to be done? A mistake? Well, why should something be done? Harriet. You must think he is 500 million miles above me, Miss Woodhouse. Then why should you not? I'm the natural daughter of nobody. Why should he give me a thought? I'm the natural daughter of nobody. And I should set up for crumbs on the table, be grateful for what I have got. That's what you're thinking, that's your implication. Well, I don't accept that I'm bound to my station and I don't agree. But just because he's Mr. Knightley of Dornwell Abbey, he's too good for me. Harriet? Have you any idea of Mr. Knightley returning your affection? Oh, yes. I must say that I have. And now I seem to feel that I might deserve him. Why is it so much worse that Harriet should be in love with Mr. Knightley than Frank Churchill? Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. He is just my friend, member of the family, always there whenever I'm in. Dependable and fair, yet difficult and brooding. If there's something more, I'm unaware. I cannot be in love. It is not convenient or practical or preferable. It does not make sense. I cannot be in love. That would be too grim. I cannot imagine I could feel that way. No, it's too absurd. No one would believe it. He has been around me all my life. But why do I feel weak and suddenly distracted, longing to be bored by his critique? I cannot be in love. It's not what I intended or counted on or bargained for. 
me that was not the plan. I cannot be in love. That would be so wrong. I cannot believe that I have loved him all along. Oh, but Harry, why has my blood gone cold? I've seen him look at her. Why must this be so hard? It's only Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. should marry me. Yes, I'm madly in love. And though it's not convenient, it's wonderful, it's torturous. And I think I may have hives. Yes, I'm sadly in love. For there's no guarantee that there might be but half a chance that he's in I received from your son Frank. What later? I mentioned it this morning. Were you not listening, Mr. Weston? Uh, indeed I was. Not, <laughs> Mrs. Weston. What does he write? He declares his regret for his shameful behavior towards our dear Emma. Uh, yeah, yeah. Had he not been convinced of her indifference, he never would have indulged in such selfishness. He's a good lad. In fact, he was within a moment of confessing the truth to her at Hartfield when you yourself interrupted them, my love. <sighs> so the blame lies with me, eh? <laughs> of course. Yeah, very well, then. He is impatient for my reply. And what will you write? That he is forgiven, of course. And of my news, Mr. Weston. What news is there, Mrs. Weston? I am with child. <laughs> with insufferable vanity, I believed I had the secret of everyone's feelings. Unpardonable arrogance, I propose to arrange everyone's destiny. I have been proven to be universally mistaken, and even worse, I have done mischief. It was badly done. I was such a fool. It was so naive. Now I'm mortified. It was badly done. And what makes it worse? Woodhouse, we were so long without your company, and you really are a dear to have apologized for that particular day. But I assure you, it is not necessary. On the contrary, Miss Bates, my remark was rude and thoughtless. You are too dear a friend to let that go unattended. Oh my, you need not make a kerfuffle on my account. Well, at last I have made my peace with Miss Bates. That was well done of me. If only Mr. Knightley could be here to witness my humility and thoughtfulness. Surely he would no longer think ill of me. Is it possible he could be thinking of Harriet Smith? How ghastly. I mean, if Harriet believes that Mr. Knightley could be attached to her, and if indeed he is, th oh, then it is all my own doing. Humiliation. 
condition Now you can know what it feels like to suffer in shame Humiliation Now there is no one in England but yourself to blame And aside from the anguish and torment How does it feel? I was the one who convinced her she should have feelings for him. Now he's gone to his brother's house in London with no word of when he might return. Mr. Knightley! Emma. You've returned then? Apparently. I trust your trip was a pleasant one. Oh, it's most pleasant. And how are your brother and my sister? Oh, uh, both well, very well. They send uh, their best to you and your father. The children? Both well. Very well indeed. How nice. Yes. Well then. Very good. Well. Yes, yes, yes. Emma. Mr. Knightley. I have heard the news. The news? Of Frank Churchill's engagement to Jane Fairfax. That is why I have returned early from my stay. Yes, you were probably less surprised than any of us. Time will heal your wound, Emma. He is a scoundrel, there can be no doubt of that now. You are very kind, but you are mistaken. My only regret is that I was not in on the secret earlier. <laughs> well, I, I confess I could never assure myself as to the degree of what you felt. I have never been attached to Frank Churchill. My vanity was flattered, but he has not injured me. <laughs> He's a most fortunate man. Everything he does turns out for his good. He behaves abominably, yet at no cost to himself. He meets a young woman, gains her affection. His aunt is in the way. His aunt dies! He uses everybody ill and all are persuaded to forgive him. He is a most fortunate man indeed. You speak as if you envied him. I do. In uh, one respect, he is very much the object of my envy. Will you not ask me what the point is of my envy? Determined to have no curiosity, Emma, I must now tell you what you will not ask. No, don't speak it. Take your, a little time, consider your thoughts, do not commit yourself. If you do not wish to hear the words I mean to speak, you need only tell me, and I will go. I'll just say what you must and let us be done with it. I, I will say what I must because it, it, it comes from my heart, not, not because I wish to cause you any distress. In fact, the, the very opposite is true. Ah, Emma, I cannot make speeches. You know who I am. You hear nothing but truth from me. I've blamed you and lectured you, and you have borne it as no other woman in England would have borne it. But please, bear with these truths I tell you now. Emma, I'm helpless in your grace. I see your kindred face when I close my eyes. Emma, the dawn breaks with your smile And for just a while I am comforted And if I never hold you, if I never touch you If I never have the chance to quite express what I most hope for love Then I will never, I will never know love We'll never know joy. We'll never know what it's like to stroke your hair and feel your skin against my skin. What is this endless dance we're in? Emma, I've held this back too long. Tell me, is it wrong to be in love with you? Emma, my soul lies at your feet. I have been discreet, but 
now I'm without you. Tell me if I might have any hope of you ever returning my love. <laughs> oh, my dearest man, I do not know that I believe I deserve your love. I have made a folly of everything, mistaken on every count. Can you really love someone so terribly flawed as I? Then what of me? I couldn't bear you showing any affection to Frank Churchill, so I made my mind up to go away to my brother's house to save myself. But I went to the wrong place. You came back to me. Yes. Best of all creatures. Faultless. In spite of all your faults. <laughs> Emma, I've known you all your life. Will you be my wife and bring me happiness? Yes, Mr. Knightley. Yes, I will happily and completely. <laughs> will you not call me by my given name? Oh, no, I will not. Why will you not? Because I cannot call you George. But that is my name. <laughs> it is a most unfortunate name. No, I will continue to call you Mr. Knightley, and on the occasion when you are being disagreeable, I will call you Knightley. <laughs> but I cannot, under any foreseeable circumstances, ever call you George. Emma, you mock me even now. Of course. What better time? <laughs> Oh, I think it's time we told your father the unhappy news. Oh, dear. Huh? Harriet! N Emma! Emma! But this is most distressing. Papa. Most distressing indeed. Oh, Papa, please try to understand. And you say this was decided weeks ago? Yes, uh, three weeks to be exact. We delayed telling you. <laughs> Does anyone want any brandy? Oh. oh, Papa, you did not think I would stay unmarried forever. Yes, yes, I did. You quite said as much. Oh, yes, I did, didn't I? But Mr. Knightley and I are so happy. Cannot you be happy for us, Papa? No, no, I cannot. I do not see the sense in young people getting married. It is a most annoying inconvenience. But, Papa, Mr. Knightley has offered to live here with us at Hartfield. So, you see, I will not be leaving you after all. Mr. Knightley will live here? If you will allow it. Oh, dear. I don't know. I don't like... Change. But Mr. Knightley is here every day already. Miss Woodhouse? Oh, Miss Smith. We haven't seen you in quite some time. Please, Papa, consider it. You are always here, aren't you, Mr. Knightley? I am indeed. I don't suppose you'd ever consider calling me George. George? Good Lord. Mi Harriet, it's good to see you. I hope you do not mind that I came. I received your letters, but I wanted to tell you in person how glad I am for your happiness. Do you really mean that? Yes. With all my heart, I do, Miss Whithouse. <laughs> I am so relieved to hear you say it. And yet I am so ashamed of my own conduct, I do not know if I can ever be wholly forgiven. I'm afraid, Miss Woodhouse, it is I who must ask to be forgiven, though I will understand it if you wish never to see me again. Harriet, what do you mean? Well, 
It was all a happy coincidence. <laughs> we happened to be seated together quite by chance at a small gathering at Mrs. Cole's. I'm not exactly sure what it is you are telling me. Miss Woodhouse, I am to be married. Married? This is wonderful news! <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you still have not told me to whom? Mr. Robert Martin asked me for the second time to be his wife. Gladly I agreed. Oh, I it. Mr. Robert Martin never gave up hope that I'd return his love. And I have indeed. Isn't it lovely? Oh, I know you must be disappointed in me, Miss Woodhouse, and for that I cannot blame you. And although you may wish never to see me... Oh, Harriet, I... you are wrong. I am deliriously happy for you both. <laughs> I am your friend now and will be your friend always. But this time it is my intention to be the sort of friend who does not interfere in the lives of those she truly loves. Oh, Miss Woodhouse! <laughs> I did not think it possible to be happier still than I already am. <laughs> I only ask one thing. What is that? That you bring Mr. Martin here to Hartfield, so that I may shake his hand. <laughs> yes, <laughs> gladly. Oh, Harriet. Oh, yes, Miss Woodhouse. Make sure he is wearing a green shirt. And a little help from me. Though I was wary at first, opinions and attitudes can be reversed. Emma? I made the match myself. I think not. Point of fact. Oh, sorry, no. They fell in love in spite of you is rarely more exact. You're wrong again. Cavalier. And to you have me yes, to interfere. Lucky that you meddled or we might not be together. And yes, your brother and my sister have three children. It's, it's confusing. confusing. Mr. Knightley. It would not be 